This contest is scheduled for one fall. Introducing first from San Benito, Texas, weighing 235 pounds, Aldo Marino. And his opponent from Sarasota, Florida, weighing 239 pounds, Randy Macho Man Savage. The Macho Man, Randy Savage, who is quite a competitor, making his World Wrestling Federation debut. Color, color, colorful robe there, and a look at the uh, face moments ago of the Macho Man, Randy Savage. Well-built young man, Bruno. Yes, he is. I'll tell you, he's made quite a reputation for himself. I, uh, I hear a lot of great things about him. Uh, not too pleasant as far as his style. He's, he's a very good wrestler, but he's a very mean individual. But uh, he has certainly has been a winner, and he is well-known all over the world. The Macho Man finding uh, not too many friendly faces out about ringside. Oh, nice arm drag technique by Aldo Moreno. Oh, look at that. Mr. Fuji, Bobby the Brain Heenan, out about ringside. Wait a minute, there's Freddie Blassie. I think I saw Valiant, too. Yeah, and Fuji. Shoulder block by Aldo Marino. Off the rope again, back body, no! Sunset flip, one, two! No. Nope. Oh, Talk about a clothesline. Randy Savage in control. Oh my goodness! Look at that maneuver, would you? Oh, it was a, that. That was a, a first. Uh oh, what's coming now? Elbow to the back of the head. The Macho Man, Randy Savage, covering Aldo Moreno. One is all they got. All he wanted, I think. Moreno out to the outside. I think these managers are out here all to take a look at Randy I Savage. think so. I think so. They oh, see no. some new talent. What's he going to do? Oh, my goodness. Well, there. Macho Man, Randy Savage, attacking from the outside. This fellow's got quite a reputation. I think that's what these managers are out here for. I think they're looking him over, and I'm sure that they want to, they would like to manage him. I don't believe I've ever seen any one individual attract so many managers at ringside to take a closer look. What's it gonna happen now? The Macho Man, Randy Savage on the top rope. Ooh, bah, with an elbow. Oh, now what? On the second rope, no, on the top rope again. Macho Man, Randy Savage. Ooh, another one. Brother. What an This has to be it. Oh. Look, look, look at this. Here comes Blassie. He'll be the first one to open up his big wallet to see if he can get this guy. The Macho Man congratulated by Bobby the Brain Heenan. There by Freddie Blassie. Pat on the back by Jimmy Hart. Mr. Fuji with a handshake. And Johnny Valiant there. Oh, my goodness, I can't believe what I'm seeing. Here is your winner, Randy Macho Man Savage. The Macho Man, Randy Savage. Yes, indeed, he is really put together. Uh-oh, oh no. Marino over the top rope, and the Macho Man up on the top rope as well. Perched up there. Randy Savage really trying to impress these managers. Oh my, across the back of the head. What a prestigious evening, and I'm so thrilled just to be a part of this thing because history is going to be made right here in the horizon tonight as this very prestigious 16-man elimination tournament takes place. That's right, Gorilla. I'm pumped up. I'm here to call it like it is, as Jesse DeBody always does, and Chicago and the world get ready.
What's the crack, fellas? Jay Hunter here with Old School Wrestling's Video Classic Reviews, or OSW Reviews, with episode hash 002. The next big WWF event after WrestleMania 1 wasn't WrestleMania 2, it was WWF's first experimental foray into pay-per-view, The Wrestling Classic. The World Wrestling Federation presents WrestleVision. From the Rosemont Horizon in Chicago, Illinois, it's The Wrestling Classic. Tonight, a 16-man elimination tournament featuring Ricky Steamboat, Adrian Adonis, Tito Santana, Cowboy Bob Orton, Ivan Putski, Randy Savage, The Junkyard Dog, Terry Funk, Paul Orndorff, Moondog Spot, Corporal Kirshner, The Magnificent Morocco, The British Bulldogs, Davy Boy Smith, and The Dynamite Kid, Nikolai Volkov, and The Iron Chief. In addition, the announcement of the winner of the Rolls-Royce Silver Cloud 3. Plus, in the main event, a world heavyweight title bout, Rowdy Roddy Piper challenges the champion Hulk Hogan. And now Vince McMahon. Yep, that's right, Jay Hunter doing this one solo. We originally weren't going to cover this pay-per-view, but I thought I might as well since it's somewhat of a landmark in the WWF. The lads will be back next time. Right off the bat, the opening video, filmed in WrestleVision, and with Back to the Future's Back in Time theme, that is awesome. So what is the wrestling classic? It's the very first WWF pay-per-view exclusive. Well, I say exclusive because WrestleMania was almost completely shown on the closed circuit TV. Uh, it was broadcast in theaters, that kind of thing, having an almost negligible amount of pay-per-views. So technically the first WWF one was WrestleMania 1. But the Wrestling Classic was the first WWF pay-per-view exclusive. From suburban Chicago's Rosemont Horizon, which is now known as the Allstate Arena in Rosemont, Illinois, taking place on November 7th, 1985, which if you're keeping track, that's three weeks before NWA Starcade, so that's no coincidence. The event featured a 16-man tournament and a WWF Championship match, Hulk Hogan defending the strap against Roddy Piper. Just FYI, the champions going into this pay-per-view were as follows. The WWF champion was Hulk Hogan since January 84, almost into a year and a half. The WWF women's champion was Wendy Richter, who won at a WrestleMania 1 in March earlier in the year. The IC champion was Tito Santana since July. And the WWF tag team champions were Brutus Beefcake and Greg Valentine since August. Uh, the Wrestling Classic was hosted by Vince McMahon and Lord Alfred Hayes in front of a big tournament billboard and Eye Candy Susan was there with a pointer as Vince runs down the first round matches. Vince throws to a video of wrestlers picking their opponents out of a fishbowl and Savage drops a do the thing comment to Elizabeth. Yes. What a thing. Throw to WWF President Jack Tunney and Mean Gene as they poorly reiterate the tournament rules. Uh, the commentary is by Gorilla Monsoon and Jesse Ventura. Man, it's great to hear them and Finkel doing ring announcing. Monsoon and Ventura have such great chemistry, both sounding very credible, adding a lot of colour to the matches without ever actually overshadowing the match, which is quite a difficult thing to do. Although Monsoon was play by play, he wasn't always 100% calling moves correctly, sometimes relying on generic phrases, you know, um, a technique that McMahon would master many years later. Alright, so let's get into the pay-per-view. The first round match is Adrian Adonis with manager Jimmy Hart versus Corporal Kirshner. Uh, to be honest, I thought he'd be a heel with that name, but no, Kirshner is the face and Adonis is the heel. Kirshner, is, he's also known in Japan as the masked leather face for keeping track. Monsoon notes that Ventura and Adonis were a tag team called the East-West Connection. <laughs> I forgot that Jimmy Hart would shout instructions and motivation to his wrestlers via the microphone. So going through this match, there's a long headlock spot by Kirshner. Monsoon notes that Adonis has bulked up, aka he's put on a fair whack of weight. Another great example of wrestling logic as Adonis winds up his arm before delivering an elbow drop. Makes no sense. Adonis had most of the offense. He wins in just over three minutes, reversing a suplex attempt, where Kirshner couldn't remember where his hands go into a DDT. I love how in the 80s pinfalls are more realistic. Kirshner kicked out at a 3.1 and heel Adonis bolts from the ring afterwards. They replay the finishing spot. As you can see, the Kirshner takes the DDT bump on his ear. He must have taught Kane how to bump. Uh, if, you know, if that's the reference, if he, he takes moves like uh, Triple H's pedigree on his knee, he doesn't actually take the full bump. 
Uh, so we cut to Oakland, who gets a quick interview with Adonis and Hart. Overall, it was a short nothing match. There's likely a lot of this to come in the pay-per-view. Uh, it's probably why single night tournaments like King of the Ring were generally cut down to just the quarterfinals and then just the semi-finals on the night. So the next first round match is Dynamite Kid, which is one half the British Bulldogs, faced the Soviet Nikolai Volkov. Man, it's great. We get to see the precursor to Benoit himself. Volkov does the Soviet national anthem shtick to great heel heat, as we can see some people leaving in the crowd. Brilliant. Dynamite is absolutely ripped. Oh, Jesus. Dynamite gets the win with an unexpected dropkick. Great booking to have Billington advance quickly. The crowd loved it. Dynamite did a forward somersault in joy. It's pretty impressive, alright. It's pretty cool to see such a massive roidy magoo do something so athletic. Ten seconds and we're done. Thank you, Elizabeth. Oh, yes. Elizabeth, you're uh... Oh, it's so exciting. I can, uh, it's just the most exciting night for me. Cut to Oakland chatting to Savage. Holy shit, did Elizabeth just talk? All she says was, it's so exciting, it's just an exciting night for me. But I always thought the only words she spoke in the WWE were, ooh yeah, in response to her marriage proposal. There's a, tri- there's a trivia question for you. Gene goes over his match with Ivan Putsky. Liz sounded very uneasy on the mic, but that makes sense since she's not a wrestler. She's a manager though. Well, she should be able to talk, but I, I guess he's just a valet, you know? Alright, the next match is Macho Man Randy Savage with his manager, Miss Elizabeth, uh, taking on Polish power, Ivan Putski. Yes, Ivan Putski, the Polish power. Father of the famed Scott Putski, the most ridiculously ripped wrestler in the Attitude Era. He had one pay-per-view appearance in the WWF in Ground Zero 1997, where he blew out his knee in a matter of minutes and never appeared on WWF TV again. Of course, WCW picked him up for a cup of tea. Putski shows his confidence by goading Savage to take a free shot. Disgusting that Paduski, that's what Ventura calls him, spat in Savage's face. Also, Monsoon quips that Savage did that to him first. Macho plays the small guy that is easily overpowered by Putski. Despite being at least four inches smaller than Savage, who isn't a small guy. Uh, Putski does the I'm not taking the head into the turnbuckle spot, which is pretty awesome. We never see that today. Putski continues with the basic power moves and then Macho shoots for a single leg and gets Putski in a pin using the ropes in kind of classic heel flare style. Yeah, that's it. He gets the pin. Another short match under three minutes. Man, 80s wrestling is very slow, but it works well with short matches. McMahon, I've seen Russia a whole last laugh. He laughs the best and I've not finished my laughing yet. Backstage Vince shows the updated tournament board as Volkov interrupts giving out. He says, he who laughs, laughs, laughs the best, and I'm not finished laughing yet. What? (laughs) Alright, next match. In a rare face versus face matchup, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat battles the other half of the British Bulldogs, Davy Boy Smith, who was just as Roydy Magoo as Dynamite. Nice mat wrestling counters to start the match. Monsoon calls Steamboat Steamer. Lovely bridge spot out of the pinfall. Even in standard def, you can see Davies staring on Juice back knee. Nasty. Monsoon mentions that it's not smart to not hook the leg. Davy controls the match until Steamboat counters a suplex attempt with a delayed vertical suplex of his own. The ref calls for the bell very quickly after the bulldog gets crushed by the top rope. I've never seen this particular finish before. Maybe he pulled his groin or something. Well, it's one way to have the match end but not have a big time face do the job so quickly. Yeah, the big steamer advances. Back to Oakland and JYD. He cuts a serious face promo. Oakland pushes that Chicago is my kind of town. It must be some popular song in 1985. Okay, so the next match is the master of the big thump power slam, Junkyard Dog, facing Iran's number one and former WWF champion, The Iron Sheik. JYD gets his theme song, Grab Them Cakes. (laughs) Good job, WWF. Just mentioned there's no Blassie coming out with Sheik. She gets the early heel advantage with some awful chops and choking him with his garb. JYD does a Hogan no sell, then she bows to him for mercy. It's a bit early for that. JYD counters with a full Nelson with a butt bump. I love Sheik's setup to the camel clutch with his hands out and how he stepped into it. The two were chatting with the ref and just ended the spot. It was it was really weird. Sheik manhandles the ref and turns the headbutt into a pin, and JYD gets the pin in three and a half minutes. I hate when refs incorporate the dropping to the mat with the one count, so it just looks like a two count. Anyway, so JYD advances. 
So we cut to Terry Funk, who wants a shot at Paul Orndorff and wants $50,000 to wrestle Roddy Piper. He's going to become the world's heavyweight champion. I have no idea what this guy is talking about. Oh, man, Funk gobs into the camera, his tobacco obscuring it. It's disgusting. Okay, so we got three more first round matches up. So the next one is Moondog Spot battling Terry Funk. There sure are a lot of dogs in the WWF. Moondogs, Junkyard Dog, British Bulldog, Michelle McCool. Ayo! The list goes on. Okay, so Funk cuts a heel promo asking both to settle for a draw, which bone holding hobo Moondog Spot agrees with. Hilariously, Funk turns on him in a matter of a few seconds and they brawl at the outside, but Funk can't get into the ring before being caught. And Spot gets into the ring before the tank out. So, another creative finish. Yeah, I love this. You know, 30 seconds and we're done. Moondog Spot with the upset. Who is this homeless man, Moondog Spot? He's like a white Kimbo slice. Do anything to you. I feel so sorry for you, boy, son. <laughs> okay, so cut to an interview with Fuji and Don Morocco. Fuji says he feels so sorry for Tito. That's, that's just racist. Morocco who's supposed to be a heel, mind you, says Tito's got it all and he's the best and he wants to beat the best. Awful. Well, you know, by this point you can see there's definitely a formula to this pay-per-view interview match, interview match. Okay, so the next match is the IC champion Tito Santana against the man he defeated for the title, the magnificent Morocco with Mr. Fuji. Gorilla says that this match would be a main event anywhere in the entire world. I I don't know about that. Uh, The commentators tout the altruism of Tito being in this tournament. Apparently the IC champ didn't have to be in it. Why wouldn't you want to compete on a pay-per-view and in a tournament? Well, I guess there's nothing at stake, but uh, faces aren't concerned with that. I I love wrestling logic. Back and forth to start the match, Morocco does a poor man's flair corner spot. I could swear Tito reversed the whip to the ropes, but Morocco didn't want to run, so he just took a back bump and Tito continued the armbar. It's a disgrace. Morocco gets the three after a power slam near the ropes. The camera intentionally doesn't show where Tito's feet are. Morocco foolishly celebrates as Tito rolls him up for the legit three in four and a half minutes. I see what you did there. The commentators work it out slowly and explain that Santana's foot was over the ropes, making Morocco's pain null and void, and Tito got the quick win. I guess that rule's not enforced these days unless uh, you seem to have to grab the rope, but it should be legal that you just put your foot under the rope. The rules that suit the booking, I guess. Anyway, backstage, Algolan interviews Heenan, who fobs off why his wrestlers aren't in this tournament, and gets upset about Gene using the word weasel. He sells the storyline that he's got a $50,000 bounty on Mr. Wonderful, Paul Orndorff's head. Okay, the final match of the first round pits Mr. Wonderful, Paul Orndorff, against ace cowboy Bob Orton. Robert Keith Orton, the original RKO, he plays the heel, complete with the trademark cast on his left forearm. The commentators put over the bounty on Orndorff's head as he starts off hot working on the left arm of Orton. Countered sunset flip which results in Orton getting his builder's bum out. Uh, Orton slows down the pace, generally working on the head. Orndorff is surprisingly over. The Mr. Wonderful is quite a heel gimmick. Wonderful punches Cowboy who bumps over the top rope and lands Undertaker style on his feet. He adjusts his cast to possibly tighten it I guess and smashes Orndorff in the face in full view of the referee and gets DQ'd in six and a half minutes. How he's able to compete in the ring with a cast but not use it as a weapon is debatable. I guess, well, it's not like he took it off and hit him with it, so I don't know. As with all of these matches, they only last a few minutes, so it's hard to describe if they're really any good, you know. They're either under three minutes or up to six minutes at most. Backstage McMahon and Alfred Hayes, who seems to be playfully manhandling the valet, Susan, go over the updated brackets. So what we have in the quarterfinals are Adonis vs Dynamite, Macho Man vs Steamboat, JYD vs Moondog, and Tito vs Orndorff. Terry Funk interrupts and starts giving out to Vince his back to the hard camera. You can see, if you have a look, McMahon actually slightly pulls Funk's tights uh, to turn him towards the camera, which he half does. Brilliant. Okay, so we're on to the quarterfinal matches with a 15 minute time limit. Dynamite Kid versus Adrian Adonis. Okay, before each match starts, the thing tells us which wrestler the participants have beat to progress. Adonis looks in worse shape than Husky Harrison. Maybe his nickname Adonis is just a rib on his physique. 
Even after a few moves, he looks gassed. After a minute, Ventura walks out, leaving the commentary booth to go talk to Savage. Adonis slows the pace and works on the left leg really slowly. He locks in a sharpshooter, which is deemed a leg grapevine by Gorilla. Dynamite gets cut off with a comeback, but on second attempt, builds up to a big head of steam, a couple of headbutts, a snap suplex. Jimmy Hart gets onto the apron. Adonis uh, gets Dynamite in an O'Connor roll, which is reverses Dynamite shows Adonis into Hart, who sells like death as Billington gets the pinfall. Afterwards, Adonis throws a Christian circa 2002 hissy fit in the ring. Decent enough, five and a half minutes though. Backstage, Ventura cuts a promo putting over Macho Man, saying two heads are better than one, and they've got three heads. <laughs> that being Ventura, Macho Man, and Liz. Mean Gene called Steamboat the steamer again. Uh, so good for him. So the next match, uh, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat versus Mr. I've Got Theme Music, Macho Man Randy Savage. At the start of the match, Macho Man hides behind Liz, but tries a cheap shot Steamboat, and Gorilla calls it a Pearl Harbor job. Dragon gets Savage in a head scissors and takes him over the top rope. It's at this point I notice there's no outside padding on the floor, just concrete. Who'd want to take a bump on that? The two work a very fast pace, which is really enjoyable. Uh, lots of top rope action. Steamboat starts off in control with chalks, etc. Savage gets the brass knuckles from his tights, and when Steamboat back body drops him, Savage hits Steamboat in the face once with it, which he sells very well. Savage gets a three as he stuffs it back into his tights and does a legger afterwards. Shame this match only lasted about three and a half minutes. It's just an angle, really, but you can tell the two are very good workers. Backstage, Mean Gene is with Moondog Spot. Moondog has a large leg bone in his hand. He starts hitting it with his head and muttering incoherently as Mean Gene gives up as Ventura puts over Savage again. Okay, so the second quarterfinal match is Moondog Spot versus JYD. I noticed that JYD, his security entourage, has a lot of brothers. These two, gimmick wise, they should make a great tag team. Uh, Moondog misses a top rope splash, which was telegraphed way ahead of time. JYD does two headbutts from running on all fours, then a standing headbutt, and then counts his own fall. There's no ref. The fans cheer and the bell rings, and the unseen official outside counts it as a win. He... He, he counts his own fall. Backstage, Heenan tells Mean Gene that Piper's gonna be the next WWF champion because Hogan's tired. Okay, so we got Paul Orndorff versus Tito Santana, which is another face versus face match. Ventura postulates that Santana will turn heel and take out Orndorff for the money. He calls him a taco salesman from Tijuana, Mexico. It's a quite a slow, methodical match. Tito starts off with a long, snug headlock and a long head scissors. Orndorff turns a hammerlock into a chicken wing. That's a word or a move we don't hear about these days, you know? A couple of reversals and two standoffs, it's clear that both are working as baby faces. Orndorff applies a toe hole, which is all sell by Tito. The crowd starts to get a bit restless, because this match is just, just at a standstill. Story of the match is Tito's injured left leg. The two brawl outside as the ref administers the fastest 10 count in history. After 8 minutes, that's what you get. The two continue to brawl as the ref calls for the bell and the two break up. Thus far, this is the longest and slowest match with a bullshit finish. Jesus. Back to Vince in the brackets. Uh, hey, oh, I'll tell you what, uh, Hayes gives the valet Susan a smooch. Well, she's not struggling, so yeah, I guess 50 no's and a yes is a yes. So in the semi-finals, we have Dynamite Tom Billington versus Randy Savage, and JYD gets a buy in the finals. Okay, so the next match is WWF Champion Hulk Hogan versus Roddy Piper, uh, face versus heel. Wow, this is a WrestleMania main event quality matchup. Hopefully he doesn't follow the trend of the matches before, and we'll see. Piper looks really young, he's B31 at the time, and he comes out with a group of Scottish bagpipers. Backstage, Hogan cuts a promo. His ripped headband and whisper of hair makes his egghead look so big. Anyway, Hulk name drops WrestleMania 1 and says Piper's gonna have egg on his face verbally and physically. Okay. Hogan sporting a white American made t-shirt and matching tights, knee pads and boots. This must be before he exclusively wore red and yellow, brother. The crowd are very behind Hogan. Hulk starts off strong as Piper does a flare flop. Gorilla calls a back body drop a suplex. Two big elbow drops. Hulk is dominant here. 
It's like he hulked up before Piper got in any offense. Just a brawling match and eventually Piper gets control of the match. A bit of overselling tiredness at the start of the match. Long sleeper spot where Hulk keeps the arm up on the three count. I think people winning with the sleeper is more of a WCW thing. Well, I suppose if you don't count the million dollar man. They brawl outside as some fan throws his pop at Piper, misses by a mile as security find out who it was. Hulk mini no sells. Piper axe handles Hogan into the ref for a bump. Chair shot to the back as garbage starts to be thrown into the ring. Hogan gets the chair, uses it and gets in a sleeper of his own. Ace Orton comes out and attacks Hogan for the DQ. Gorilla drops another Pearl Harbor line as Orndorff makes a save. Uh, the match never got out of first gear and was 7 minutes and change. Cut to the fans, one of which rubs his nose with his middle finger. <laughs> Hogan and Orndorff left the ring, posing together. You're all real good, Mean Gene. Everybody's into the match. We have some great matches tonight. I just watched some of that match with Hulk Hogan. What a hell of a match in the Ryder Ryder Piper this time. I'm hoping so, Mean Gene. I'm hoping so. I work real hard for it. I've been training off about two and a half weeks real heavy. I dropped down from 285. I'm down about 266. Mean Gene, I'm getting ready. Let's all right. Well, Chuck, I'd have to say that if uh, anything happens here tonight and you should win, uh, we may be doing a little juking in we Chi Town. We'll go down to Chi Town to win the center and let everything blow, baby. We'll let all right. Anyway, JYD cuts an incomprehensible promo at 100 miles per hour that I'm going to make you listen to as Mean Gene reiterates that he's got a bye in the finals. Jimmy Hart interrupts uh, talking about his red underwear. Okay, so we've got two matches left. Uh, so this is the first and only semi-final match because JYD is in the final. So we got Dynamite Kid versus Randy Savage for a spot in the final, and only Savage gets entrance and music. Savage comes out with a new America cloak. It's nice. Savage can't get the best of Dynamite, so he works the crowd on the outside. I can't get over Dynamite's size. You know, he's only a few inches smaller than Savage, but it's far thicker. Anyway, lots of reversals, so the match is very equal. Gorilla says Macho scales the rope like a monkey. The finish comes when Dynamite hits a top rope superplex, but god damn it, Savage hooks the leg and gets the three. How is this possible after taking a suplex? I, I suppose the logic can only be found in the mysterious book of wrestling rules. Clocking in at under five minutes, it was far too short, but it was still a match of the night. McMahon and Susan plugged the Silver Cloud three Rolls Royce that a fan's gonna win. Great. Apparently they had hundreds and thousands of entries over the last month. The crowd don't really care, they only perk up when someone throws a soda in the ring, almost hitting one of the stiffs. Great job, Michael Hamley from Illinois. Uh, Lord Alfred tries to work the crowd who have none of it and start booing him. Let's give him a real good Chicago cheer! Come on! <laughs> Not spelled the end of trying to get buys by hawking a lottery. Not that you even have to be in attendance to win. In the men's locker room, Gene talks to Hogan and then Orndorff cuts a lame ringy ding ding promo on Orton and Piper and abruptly cut off. I'll make sure you gotta listen to that one. Well, you know what's so funny about the whole situation, me and Gene, is everybody expected this man, but nobody knew it was gonna take four and a half, five months to get done, you know. Well, ring a ding ding, Roddy Roddy Piper, round two. And guess what? Neither one of us have had enough, Piper, you or me. And the way it looks, your cowboy Bob Orton, ace bodyguard, he wants some of it too. Well, you know something? My brother, Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, we kind of watch each other's back, you know. We kind of always watch each other's back. And we got one thing to say. Roddy Roddy Piper, anywhere, anytime, any place, you, the cowboy Bob Orton, want to step in the ring for ringy ding ding round three, brother. You got it. You know something, Hunter? Ready. So we're down to the main event of the night, the final match of the tournament. Randy Savage versus Junkyard Dog. Bink says this match will determine the championship in the elimination tournament. What championship? What does the winner get exactly? Gorilla says there's prestige to be won, but that's the same as every match, I guess. Uh, Savage comes out with a new headband and tie-dye shirt. There's a real nice cleavage shot as the cameraman watches Liz get up on the apron and holds the rope open for Savage. Again, Savage uses Liz as a human shield and escapes via the outside. There's lots of stalling heel tactics from Savage. Savage gets the chair and another, who throws the second to the ring, but uh, JYD bangs his own head repeatedly on it and throws it out to a great pop from the crowd. I guess he, like foreigners, have extremely hard heads and so chair shots have no effect. 
Makes sense, I guess, as his offense includes a lot of headbutts. JYD plays powerhouse, Savage playing tired from having wrestled an extra match. For some reason, Mean Gene gets on commentary. JYD beats up Savage with simple moves with a deliberate pace. This match is just a brawl, mostly punches and kicks. Ventura says JYD makes no bones about beating up Savage. <laughs> Savage turns the tide. After a double axe handle from the top rope, Savage gets in the ring and out another side and sneak attacks JYD. That's more wrestling logic. As Oakland drops the third Pearl Harbor reference. The ref sees him using a chair shot to the back of JYD, but he doesn't call for DQ. Even Mean Gene brings it up. Heel Savage beats up JYD on the outside, breaking up the 10 count. Three running on all fours headbots, super sold by Savage, and JYD gets back in control. JYD back body drops Savage onto the outside, which gets a big pop, and the ref, Dave Hebner, has the fastest screw job 10 count since earlier in the night, and fucking hell, the pay per view finishes on a count out. 10 minutes in the main event for that. What a bloody ripoff. Ventura gets in the ring and complains, saying that JYD hasn't wrestled as many times as Savage. And then we go back to McMahon, Lord Alfred and Susan with some awful small talk as they fade the credits over stills from the pay-per-view. Uh, but it is pretty awesome that they have that Hulk, Hulk song by uh, John Steinman. So let's have a quick roundup of the pay-per-view. Okay, so we get the vital statistics of the pay-per-view. The Wrestling Classic is from November 7, 1985 from the Rosemont Arena in Rosemont, Illinois. It drew 14,000 fans, of which 12,000 paid, and it drew 50,000 pay-per-view buys. Overall, this was thoroughly forgettable pay-per-view. There's a lot of quick matches, even though it's impressive seeing how many people can get out of job and cleanly, which was a problem in the 80s. Even the main events had fuck finishes. And that marked the last time in a few years that WWF would promote sweepstakes as a reason to watch a pay-per-view. It's bringing to mind, if you jump forward 12 years to SummerSlam 97, there was a million dollar draw in a casket, and pretty much exactly 10 years after that, there was Mr. McMahon's million dollar giveaway. So I guess we're not due another pointless giveaway gimmick until 2017. Coming out of the pay-per-view, there are pushes for JYD, which never translated into gold, Randy Savage, who got a major slow-burning heel push to the top, Ricky Steamboat as well, who'd steal the show with Savage at WrestleMania 3, and the Bulldogs, who'd see Tag Championship gold in the following year. So that was the Wrestling Classic. I'd urge you not to fish out a rare copy, you're not missing out, but it's a mundane event, but historically quite significant. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode, so stay tuned after the break for our one-man gauntlet. Alright, since the lads aren't around, I'll just discuss a quick topic. Um, now Macho Man was last seen in the WWF in November 1994. He is a two-time WWF champion and that's winning it during the Hulkamania era and that's no mean feat. And he's a one-time Intercontinental Champion, he won the untelevised 1987 King of the Ring by beating Bundy in the finals, four-time WCW Champion, won many regional titles, he's rivaled Hogan as the biggest draw in wrestling in 88-89. Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer names him as the 15th biggest draw of all time. His match with Steamboat at WrestleMania 3 is legendary and routinely tops year-end awards in the late 80s. So why, until February 2009, did WWE expunge him from its history? Well, only Randy, McMahon and a select few others know for sure. It's all hearsay, but all I can say is it must have been something horrific. Because despite, just say, like, Hogan's politics and testifying against McMahon in the steroid scandal of 92, McMahon did business with him again as soon as his WCW guaranteed contract ran out in 2002. Even the wrestling pariah, Jeff Jarrett, who hoodwinked McMahon out of a quarter of a million dollars and set up a rival wrestling company, he's been mentioned on DVDs, albeit in a less than flattering sense. Uh, Macho Madness runs only because in 2008, a shareholder demanded to know why such a big star hadn't a DVD made of his career, and Vince relented silently and made the DVD albeit without a documentary or any input from Savage. That sold well, and then came a Macho Man action figure and prominent inclusion in 2011's WWE All-Stars game, which saw Savage himself promoting the game. It's the first time Savage has been in a WWF game since 1994's WWF Raw. I don't know why he left, but all I know is that Macho Man's back, and apparently time heals even the deepest of wounds and it mends the most burnt bridges, and now there's a chance that Randy Savage can be inducted in the Hall of Fame. 
He deserves his talent and massive contribution to the industry to be recognised in the most visible stage in the wrestling world. So, uh, yeah, Randy Savage for the Hall of Fame. Do the thing! Alright, tune in next time for WrestleMania 3. This is OSW Reviews and Jay Hunter signing out.